you know, occasionally, before I get to speak, I need to write something that was said that was wrong. And uh, something was said about chili. Now, Texans don't know the definition of chili, but let me ask you this. Was chili invented in Missouri? No, it was not. Chili came from Texas. And the people that originate something make the rules of how and what it is. Just like uh, the Word of God came from him, and he gets to define the terms. And we can't define God's terms. And we can't change the, the definition of chili to include uh, foreign objects like beans. Now, beans are good, and they taste delicious, and I love a bowl of beans next to my bowl of chili, but ne'er the twain shall meet. And so, there we go, the gospel of Chile. <laughs> now, I want to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to talk about the Lord's church. And when the Lord's church was ushered into existence by the apostles of Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus had promised, of course, before he ascended back to his Father, that he would build his church in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. He said, and thou art Peter. Or verse 18, and thou art Peter, and, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the rock he was building, of course, was not on Peter. Peter was not the rock upon which Christ is building his church, but the statement that Peter had made, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, that is the rock, that is the foundation upon which he would build the church. You know, Jesus told the apostles, and specifically Peter, that he would give him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Notice verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be loosed in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, he said basically, and, and the King James sometimes is a little hard, well, I don't know if it's, it's the best translation at this point here, because the based on the Greek tense of what Jesus said, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. And so Jesus laid the foundation of the church. <coughs> he bought it with his own blood. And the apostles built thereupon through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, there it says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another built thereupon. But let every man take heed upon how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And so Jesus laid the foundation. The apostles built upon the foundation and the church is built up upon that foundation. You know, Jesus promised that the Spirit would reveal to the apostles that He would reveal unto them all truth. In John chapter 16, verses 12 through 14, there Jesus, of course, He says, Yet I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot hear them now. There were things they just were not ready to understand on that side of the resurrection, on that side of the cross. And so some things they would not understand until after the cross. So he says, you know, uh, you, you cannot bear them now. He said, goes on, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show unto you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And so the apostles would, would be revealed, all truth would be revealed to them. All things that they needed in order to, to continue to build that church, in order to uh, lead others to, to, to heaven, would be revealed unto them, would be taught unto them through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so whatsoever the apostles bound or loose were the things that Christ had revealed to him through or them to them through that process of inspiration. And so we read in Acts chapter 2 that, of course, the, the church begins there on that great day of Pentecost. And so, you know, we see there that Peter preached that first great gospel sermon, that he made that great conclusion that uh, this same Jesus whom you have crucified hath God made both Lord and Christ. 
Of course, when they heard that, they understood their guilt. They understood their sin, and they were cutting their hearts, and they said, men and brethren, a prick in their hearts, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter, of course, said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Uh, and we see that in a couple of verses later, that 3,000 there were baptized, and there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And we find out the them, of course, is talking about the church, Acts 2.47. Uh, those that were obeyed, those that uh, you know, God added daily to the church, those that were being saved. And so God adds to the church. And so we see there the church in, in, is in existence at that point. Now, the earliest leadership, and of course that's our uh, topic of discussion today, is the leadership of the New Testament church. You know, the earliest leadership in the, in the church which was established in Jerusalem, and for a period of time, the church only existed in Jerusalem. Uh, the earliest form of leadership was the direct leadership of the apostles of Jesus Christ. Their authority was vested in them by the baptism of the Holy Spirit that they received at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Uh, you know, from that point until sometime later when the upheaval in the Jerusalem church by uh, the, the, the havoc that Paul created or that Saul created in the church, somewhere up until that point, the church was only located in Jerusalem. But when Paul came, or Saul at the time, began to create havoc in the church, you know, the disciples fled the city. Notice over in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Not sure how much time has elapsed, really, since the establishment of the church, at least uh, uh, several years, perhaps. Of course, this takes place after uh, Stephen was stoned to death. And it says that Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And the devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over them, as over him. As for Saul, he made havoc in the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And so notice that the disciples fled Jerusalem. They had to. There was no choice. They were being put in prison. They were being arrested. They were being uh, persecuted. They, they fled to other areas. Everyone except the apostles. And so when they spread to these other areas... Uh, the apostles remained in Jerusalem. They spread, but they went and established churches, established congregations there in, uh, around Judea, and then later in Samaria, and then later, of course, into the uttermost part of the earth. Now, when we see in Acts chapter 8, you know, uh, one of those that fled and went everywhere preaching the word was a man by the name of Philip. You know, Philip comes down to Samaria, and of course we see the church established there. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where he met that uh, eunuch out of Ethiopia, and he uh, able to convert him. And so from there we see uh, maybe the roots of the church established in Ethiopia. And so the church's uh, congregations began to, to be established in places other than Jerusalem. Uh, remember again, the apostles are still in Jerusalem. They haven't left. And so, who is leading these congregations that are being established around the world, around the area? Who led the churches that were established by these scattered Christians? What kind of leadership and organization did these early scattered churches establish? Who had the authority to bind or loose when it came to those scattered churches, those congregations? And so, we're going to talk about that briefly you know, they must have had some form of leadership. You know, many of these congregations existed at least for a time without elders, perhaps. You know, we know that Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey went about, they established churches in various cities in Asia Minor. And then on their second lap around, so to speak, they came and established elders. So for a period of time, these congregations existed without elders. Uh, they had to have had some form of leadership Else they would have simply wandered about without any clear direction. 
And so later, of course, elders are appointed in, in, in every church by apostolic authority. Uh, so let's take a moment there. You know, how did these churches operate? The ones that, uh, for a period of time, did not have elderships established. You know, they had to, they couldn't open up the Word of God because it did not exist in written form. You know, there were those that had, of course, uh, received inspiration of the Holy Spirit, those that had received the spiritual gifts, and so perhaps there were those in the congregation. Uh, but how did they make decisions? In the same way they make decisions, the same way, really, the apostles made decisions, the really the same way that we make decisions today is based upon the authority of the Word of God. Now, we have it very convenient. We can see the authority. We can find it uh, in the Bible today. And we can go and look. And, and if we are a congregation without elders and we're trying to, to decide whether or not something we are planning to do is scriptural or not, we can look in the Word of God and we can refer to that and we can see that as our source of authority. <coughs> in the first century, with the miraculous gifts, they could consult someone who had that miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit and could uh, reveal that. Of course, we don't have that today. Uh, but when churches were fully established, and, and, you know, it is God's plan and God's desire that churches have elders. It's not always possible. Uh, but where possible, where there are those that are able to meet the qualifications, and we'll speak briefly about those later, of elders, the... God wants there to be elders. And so even as Paul and Barnabas, they traveled about on their first missionary journey, the second lap around, they were establishing elderships. Look over in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. It says there in verse 21, it says, When they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the Lord on whom they believed. And so they established elders in every church. You know, Paul also commanded Titus. You know, he sent Titus down into Crete and there he... Uh, notice what he says to Titus in Titus 1 and verse 5. He said, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. And so again, it's God's desire that churches have elderships. Now, again, it's not always possible, not every circumstance is it possible because there are not the men present that are qualified to be elders? But uh, there ought to be those that are striving to and working towards that, perhaps. So what about today? How should our churches be led today? What organizational structure should we follow? Is there a pattern we must follow? Or are we free to simply decide for ourselves? The Bible really answers all of these questions. You know, with regard to how the church is, is to be led, you know, there's a lot of uh, denominational people, they have the idea that, you know, there is a, quote, pastor who is over the, over the congregation, and under him may serve elders, and under them may serve deacons, but they have that one-man leadership of the congregation, of course, who answers to a higher authority beyond the local congregation. And again, that is not something that is found in the Scripture. And so, but we need to go back to the Scripture. Just like I, I said earlier, if we want to know what real chili is, we've got to go back to where it originated to find out what that is. If we want to make real chili, we've got to follow the real recipe, the original recipe, if you want it to be original, genuine chili. All right, we'll let that go. If you want to be the original church, you want to, to be the same church that we read about in the Bible, you go to the same source of authority. You know, it is not tradition that we refer to. You know, the, uh, the uh, Catholic Church refers a lot to church tradition that they follow. Uh, these are traditions that have been added alongside the Word of God that come from you know, the Pope and his statements and his sayings and his commandments. Those are not found in the Bible. 
You know, the Jews had the same problem. They uh, held to their oral law or their oral uh, traditions of the fathers more than they did the Word of God. So we must go to the Word of God. We must go to the source who created the church, who made the church, who purchased the church, who built the church, Jesus. He tells us how the church is built and how it is structured in His Word. And so if we want to have the genuine church, we've got to build it according to the Scriptures. You know, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 14, you know, Paul talked about being zealous in the Jewish tradition. They said it profited in the Jews' religion above many that my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of the Father. And so that's what led Paul to persecute the church. That's what led Paul to do a number of the things he did when he was still named Saul, was the traditions of the uh, Jewish religion. Uh, they set aside God's religion and created their own based upon their own traditions. He refers to that in Romans chapter 10. You know, uh, we're not governed by what mom and dad said, how they did it and how people did it in the past. 1 Peter 1.18 for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Uh, you know, many blindly follow their parents into religious error. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, they, here uh, Stephen in his inspired defense of the gospel, he said, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. When we decide to do something different from what the Scriptures teach, we are resisting the Holy Spirit. We are resisting uh, inspiration. We are resisting the Word of God. And, and we must not do that. And we must not follow others in doing so. If our parents and our grandparents have done this, and we look and we see that's not scriptural. We don't follow them. We change and we follow the Word of God. Let every man be a liar, but let God be true. Then Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37. Uh, it says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We... We uh, can't refer to tradition. We can't just blindly follow others to find authority in religion. We must look to the Word of God. Our conscience is not to be good, not to be the authority or the gov of. That's not where we find authority. Now, our conscience can be trained according to the Word of God, but our our conscience itself is not a guide. You think about the Apostle Paul. He was sincere. And what he tried to do, Acts 23 and verse 1. Here, uh, of course, he is being persecuted uh, by, the, by the Jews. Uh, he's caused a little bit of a disturbance between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And he's arrested. He's called into question what's going on. And it says, Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Everything he did, he did with a clear conscience. He persecuted the church. He created havoc in the church. He uh, encouraged those that illegally executed Stephen. Uh, he's a murderer. He did all that stuff, and he did not violate his conscience. He thought he was doing the Lord's work. And so man's conscience really is not a true guy. Again, we can train it according to God's Word, but it must be in accordance with God's Word. You know, the decision of the majority is not to be our authority in the church. You know, there are denominations that get together today. And every congregation, the Methodist church recently did that. They had a worldwide gathering of all the Methodists from around the world to decide on doctrine. And they had a vote. And the majority of those there, which were mostly from foreign countries, uh, voted against ordaining homosexuals as ministers and preachers in the Methodist church. But they made that decision not based upon the scripture, but they made it based upon a majority vote. And that's not how the church 
is to be established. That's not how the church is to be run. You know, the majority are, are really going the wrong way. The decision of the majority is not our authority. You know, Moses commanded the people in Exodus 23 and verse 2. He said, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. And so we must refer to the Word of God. The Bible is to be our authority in all matters concerning the church as well as how the church is to be governed or led. You know, the Scriptures came from God. They did not come from man. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, Paul there tells Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. It makes us mature. It tells us all that we need. You know, God has revealed to us through the Word of God, 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything we need to know about how to organize the church, about how to live our lives, is found in the Word of God. And it is the source from which our authority uh, comes. In John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth up him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So the Bible is what we're going to be judged out of. We're going to be judged according to the Word of God. And so we need to make sure that our lives and, and the things that we do in religion are stemming from the authority of the Word of God. And so, you know, elders, they make decisions based upon the Word of God. They don't set doctrine. Elders don't have the authority to, to, to set doctrine. The doctrine is already set. Elders have uh, authority perhaps in areas that don't touch doctrine, like what color carpet, how many pews, uh, whether or not we're going to have covers on the pews or cushions on the pews or put in a ceiling fan, things of that nature. Those are the areas that elders have authority. They have the authority to say we're going to, to meet at a certain time, a certain day. They have the authority to schedule a gospel meeting uh, and, and ask that the congregation attend and, and, and things of that nature. They have the responsibility of feeding the church of God, of feeding the flock of God, and so forth. Uh, and so that's where their authority lies. And in, in the absence of elders, uh, I believe that the men basing their decisions upon the Scriptures carry the, the similar type of authority as do elders if they are in agreement and if what they are proposing is uh, in accordance with the Scriptures. And so, you know, the Lord's church is a monarchy in its government. It is not a democracy. It is not a republic. It is not a uh, representative form of government. It is a monarchy. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. In Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, it says that God hath put all things under His feet, under Christ's feet, gave him to be the head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and all. You know, in Matthew 17, verse 5, at the transfiguration, the Lord spoke from the cloud and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Remember there in Matthew 17 that uh, Jesus was transfigured. He appeared with him, uh, Elijah, and appeared with him, Moses, and Peter said, well, look, all three sources of authority are here. You know, the Jews considered Elijah as the primary prophet, as sort of the, the chief prophet, and Moses as, of course, the lawgiver. And so he put all three of those, in his mind, on equal footing. He said, let's build a tabernacle, one for each of you. And then, it's when God spoke from the cloud, here is my son. You listen to him, and when they looked up, who's there? Only Jesus. The others are gone. And so Jesus is the authority and before he ascended back to heaven, Matthew 28 and verse 18, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, or all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 
Then Jesus promised to send the apostles the Holy Spirit, who again was to teach them all things, and bring to remembrance all things whatsoever that Jesus had taught them. John 14, 26, John 15, 26, and 27. Thus, the authority to govern the church lays at the feet of Jesus and his apostles. Jesus never delegated his authority to any other than, or to any besides the apostles. He delegated that to them. He, he revealed it to them through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So leaders in the church today need to understand and abide by this truth that it is not up to us to decide doctrine. It is up to us to uh, do and find out the, and make sure that we're doing the things that God has commanded. And so another thing uh, I think that we need to at least mention briefly is the autonomy of the church. You know, many people, they look and they say, well, you know, Church of Christ is just a denomination because there's a Church of Christ in Blue Springs and there's one in Oak Grove and there's one in Sedalia and there's one right down the road and they all have the same practices, more or less. They don't use instruments. That's what most people know. You're the ones that don't like music. That's what I've heard said before. But they say, well, you're a denomination because they're multiple and it, you need to make them, they need to understand that we are each an autonomous congregation. We have the same name because we believe in the scriptures in the same way. But there is no governing body outside of the local church. One eldership does not answer uh, to another congregation. You know, uh, as a congregation that does not have elders, you do not answer to another congregation that has elders. That is not how that works. That is not the way it is set up. And so that's not the way it was in the first century. Each church was self-governing. Each was independent of another. What they had in common is the same thing we have in common, is our love for the Word of God and our willingness to abide by it and to reject all other sources of authority. And so each congregation was free and independent. They had the same head, the same foundation, the same mission, but each preached the, gospel, the same gospel. They constituted only one body, but each was independent to direct its own work. And really, there's great wisdom in this arrangement for the Lord's church. If one congregation becomes corrupted in doctrine, and sadly, we've seen it happen time and time again, or one is affected by evil practices, other churches will not be so affected. You know, if a window is made up of one large pane, you know, one little break and the whole thing is gone. But if the window is made up of many panes, you break out one, you still have most of a window. And so it is that the independence of the churches is a protection for each one. <clears throat> this simple organization, however, failed to satisfy men and they uh, created hierarchies and things like that and they had one congregation oversee another and that's what led eventually to the establishment of the Roman Catholic Church. You know, leaders of a congregation must realize that they have no jurisdiction in any other congregation. This is protection, really, for each congregation. Now, what part do elders play in governing the church? You know, the, the Bible, again, we see elders established in every church, at least at some point. Every church should be, you know, striving to have elderships. Uh, the Bible teaches that there are at least two elders in every congregation. You never see, uh, Titus is not told, for, for instance, in Titus 1 verse 5, to go and establish an elder in every church. He said elders in all of the churches, not elders over all the churches, but elders in each individual church. These men are also known as bishops or shepherds or pastors and overseers. The duties of elders, again, are not to make laws, but to see that God's law is carried out. They are overseers. They are shepherds. Look over in Acts chapter 20. You know, Acts chapter 20 is a passage that I think we, we learn a lot about the eldership. We learn a lot about the leadership of congregations. And this brief little uh, exchange that Paul has with the elders from Ephesus when he met with them at Miletus. We're going to begin in verse 28. 
Here he's talking again to the elders, the leaders of the church in Ephesus. He said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by space of three years I cease not to warn one, everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye know yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, and to remember how Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, there are uh, three words that are sometimes used to describe the office of elders. Now you have uh, the word translated most often as elders. This is the Greek word presbyteros which uh, individually means a person of age, an aged person, or uh, it's used as a body of leaders. Sometimes it refers to the Jewish leaders. A few times it refers to the apostles. But at least 16 times it's used in reference to elders of the church. And so Acts 20, verse 17, he met with the Ephesian elders. And so the elders of the church. And so that's the term that we generally use today. But there is another Greek word translated bishop. That is the Greek word episkopos, which is an overseer. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, and Titus 1, verse 7, uh, he talks about the office of a bishop. He's talking about the eldership. And so this is just one function of elders is they are bishops. They are overseers. And then you have the Greek word poimain, which is... Uh, shepherd, or pastor. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. You know, talking about the various scriptural gifts that God has given or that God gave in the first century. He gave some apostles and some prophets. Now those are things we don't have today because again, we have the complete revealed will of God in the New Testament. We don't need uh, we don't need prophets and apostles we don't have. But we have evangelists. Some have the natural ability to preach the Word of God, to, to work door to door and house to house and, and lead others to Christ. Uh, and so some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. You talk about elderships, we talk about pastors. That is the work of an elder is they are to shepherd. They are to shepherd the flock. You know, again, we look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. You know, it said there uh, in verse 28, Take heed there for unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now we have in that verse, we have all three of those Greek terms that are referred to elders there. Uh, they're called overseers. The same word as bishop, same root word. They're overseers. They're responsible for the church. You know, the church is referred to as a flock of uh, the flock of God, which is, this word is poimion, which is, you know, the, uh, the poieo or the poimen, the poimenos is a shepherd, and the poimion is the flock. And so uh, it refers to a group of sheep. And so uh, here we see the idea of pastorship, of shepherding, uh, so you're to feed the church. Uh, so you have overseers. Uh, they're to feed the church. Elders ensure that sound doctrine is fed. Just like a, a shepherd's not going to lead his sheep and feed them poisonous grass. He's going to lead them away from that. He's going to ensure that, like uh, Psalm 23, leadeth me beside uh, still waters and maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He provides the things that we need. And that's what the church elders are to do. They're to make sure, they're to feed the flock of God. They're to make sure that 
what we're what is being taught is from the word of God that it is pure, that it is healthy, that it is sound. And wow, time disappeared quick, didn't it? So elders, they have the duty to take heed to themselves and to feed the church. You know, where did the, the Catholic heresy begin? begin? It began in the elderships of congregations. That's what Paul warned these elders would happen. If they were not careful, that grievous wolves would enter in, they would not spare the flock, and of themselves would arise teachers that would lead others astray. And that's where the Catholic Church came from. Uh, they're to take heed of themselves so that that does not happen. They're to help the weak. They're to exhort those that are uh, you know, not sound in doctrine. Titus 1.9 It says, Holding fast the faithful word as thou hast been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. You know, they're to encourage the faint-hearted, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. They're to exercise oversight without lording it over the flock, 1 Peter 5 and verse 2. And again, that's part of what led to the Catholic heresy. You know, we see in 3 John, we see a, 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 an individual there by the name of Diotrephes who loved to have the preeminence in the church, and John was going to go and set him straight, but that was not the right attitude. That must not be the attitude of those that are, that are leading the church of God. They must not do so lording it over. Rather, they must be examples. 1 Peter 5.13, Neither as being lords over, or verse 3, excuse me, Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. You know, they're to watch in behalf of the souls of the members in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And so, we see the leadership in the church must be Governed by the Word of God. Whatever, whether we have elders or whether we are working to establish elders, the Word of God is the only source of authority that we can go to, that we can find out. God created the church. God made the church. God set the parameters of the church. It's up to us to consult His Word uh, as we build the church and as we grow and as we uh, strive to do the Lord's work. So I thank you for your attention and Sorry for going over a couple minutes long, but if somebody hadn't defamed Texas Chili, I wouldn't have had to stand here and defend it. Thanks.